Um, Martha McCoy is author of a, 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 a seminal book on, on women's self-defense um, and that was called Real Knockouts and that came out in the late 90s and had a huge impact. Her colleague Jill Sermiel, that is, they're now working together on a blog called Jane Fights Back. Hello, how are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Um, so, um, could we start, could I start with Martha first and then we'll, we'll, we'll introduce Jill as well. So Martha, your, your book, uh, you did two books, didn't you? you did, and one was an authored book called Real Knockout, as in real, as in actually existing. And that was really about your journey into self-defense. And then you did an edited collection that came out at a similar time and really confuses people because that's called Real Knockout, like double E-L, like as in cinematic uh, uh, female violence and self-defense, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> that was an edited volume with my colleague, Neil King. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, to, so for those, for people who don't know, there are still people in the world who, who don't know about your, your self-defense monograph. Tell us a little, little bit about the story of, of that. I mean, how that came about and, and what you hope to achieve. Well, sure. Well, that actually started as my dissertation research when I was in grad school and at University of California, Santa Barbara. And uh, it's an ethnographic study. I was a participant observer and I um, went to a variety of self-defense classes, many of which are aimed at women and were based in the sort of philosophy of empowerment based self-defense. But some were uh, geared toward men and women and didn't particularly have a feminist or gender aware approach. And uh, some were the padded attacker classes, mm. some were based in the martial arts, and some were armed self-defense classes. So through that, I, I went through the transformative experience myself that I saw happening to the other women in the class as well. And I theorized that this was uh, something that a lot of feminist theoretical understandings of gender and the body were overlooking mm -hmm. because I, I thought we really needed to understand better how the body was itself the object of a kind of sexist training and mm -hmm. that only in that embodied uh, setting where you're learning boundary setting and uh, you're can you actually transform a sexist culture starting with your own body and mm -hmm. unlearning the rules of femininity that helped prop up a rape culture ultimately so i ended up saying that one of the key myths of rape culture is the myth that women can't fight back that women are too weak helpless and vulnerable naturally to fight back, that really women can fight back and that this was a lie patriarchy had told us that we can't fight back. So I think that was the upshot of the book. So there are implications for feminist theory and understanding of the body, but also implications for how we fight against a sexist rape culture. Yeah, I, I remember, I mean, it's such a, it's a great book and it, it, it runs through all of your different experiences and all of the different types of, of, of self-defense training. And it, you, you argue that that femininity is a construct, but that one of the things that you really um, that you really grab onto is the status of, of aggression, isn't it? I mean, you say that like aggression is the for you in that book, aggression is almost like the, the watershed between masculinity and femininity and that that women aren't supposed to be aggressive and, and, and really have to kind of learn it to allow themselves to, and then that's culturally deemed, oh, that's not feminine and women shouldn't do that. Would that be fair enough to say? Yeah, I'd say that the um, a, appreciation of femininity often had to do with the appreciation of vulnerability and weakness. And so when we, when we tell women that they could fight uh, for, to protect their boundaries, we're actually telling them that they can be less feminine and that that femininity is a cultural construct. And there are other ways women are still feminine, even according to sexist constructs, but um, certainly we, we have to understand the idea that um, women and men have a right to be aggressive, and we have had a kind of gatekeeping approach in a sexist culture around aggression. Okay. That may not have come out right, but... And 
So Jill, so Neil has been sitting quietly, and so 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 Jill, how, how did how did your paths cross with Martha, and what what's your so, your origin story? I read Martha's book shortly after it came out, and I thought, oh, I wish that had been my dissertation. <laughs> Why didn't I think of this? Why didn't I write this book? So I I came to I came to self defense. Uh, by way of my work as a clinical psychologist. So my PhD is in clinical psychology and I worked as a trauma therapist for a number of years before I was in academia and in my early, in my early time in academia. I, I don't do clinical practice anymore, but my focus was trauma, interpersonal trauma specifically. And, um, and one of the things that I found as I was in graduate school and as I was finishing graduate school um, is that, uh, that one of the things that rape culture imparts to women in particular is um, how to live in fear and how to negotiate that fear and how to manage that fear. And one of the things that I realized as I was hearing people's trauma stories, which weren't always sexual assault, but which were um, often involving sexual assault, is that the kind of vicarious impact of that and experiencing that over and over um, was making me more and more afraid. And I had a colleague at the time who was also a clinical psychologist, who was a martial artist, who's a black belt martial artist. And she had found um, the self-defense program that I work with primarily, which is Prepare Incorporated. And uh, she said, you know, you should, you should take this class. And I said, absolutely, which was a complete lie. I had no intention of taking the class. And for me, it was really about being afraid. And I was, I was 100% having, having been fortunate enough to not have a personal experience of, of assault, I was 100% convinced that there would be nothing I could do in that situation. And I was afraid to take a self-defense course and find that out. Mm -hmm. And so I lied and I said, yes, I'll sign up for it. And if I had better boundaries at the time, I would have stuck with that, but I didn't. And so she said, um, you know, oh, you know, I said, I'll, I'll do it when I finish my dissertation. I was finishing my dissertation. I don't have time right now. And then I finished my dissertation and she said, oh, look, they're, you know, we're bringing it to New Jersey. There's going to be very close by you in New Jersey. And I said, okay, fine. And I called them and I gave them my credit card with fully intending to cancel and then found out I couldn't get a refund. <laughs> and so I thought, well, I can't afford to just throw this money away. And I went and I was, you know, it was a 20 hour course. I was afraid the entire time. But what I learned in that is that the fear did not have to paralyze me, mm -hmm. that I could sort of use that fear to facilitate my responding instead of to inhibit my responding. And that was right around the time that I found Martha's book. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I did some, I started doing my own research on the topic and I brought the course to the students that I teach. And so it's, a, it's part of the full impact self-defense training is part of the teaching that I do at Drew University. Um, and then a couple of years into that, I think I reached out to Martha about doing, um, a conference presentation, right? I think that was I think that was what it was, and then from there we decided to put together um, an edited volume for the journal Violence Against Women, where we collected and solicited for manuscripts on women's self defense, mm -hmm. and we have had a a lovely uh, scholarly and personal relationship since then. So, okay, that's great. I was just thinking about the the status of of fear, because. Um, because so we've got a little bit about aggression and and and, and how it's often deemed um, to be masculine, but with I remember I, I, fear. I think I turned to martial arts because of fear, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that it was in many ways a, a kind of a fantasy, kind of ritualistic attempt to ward off the, the the attacker that I was scared of that maybe never would happen. But what I've read a lot of um, self defense books. I've been researching self defense books a while ago. And, and especially feminist self-defense books. And the status of fear is, I think, is really problematic because it's almost like the, the training itself and the awareness can generate fear. Mm -hmm. that be, I mean, and you, had, you just have to learn to not be paralyzed by it. Is that, is that your line? In, in, in you know, it's, it, there was a study by Bandora, I want to say 1990, um, who looked at uh, essentially a model mugging program. And one of the things that his study found is that as a result of training, fear went down. Some of my research has shown and research of other people is that fear goes up, at least initially, fear goes up and people often become hypervigilant and sort of, you know, really thinking about it a ways, uh, situations that they had tried not to think about before. So I think it makes sense that fear can sometimes increase. And we tend to think of fear as a bad thing. I think fear is a bad thing if I have no resources to bring to it, right? So if I have a lot of fear, but low self-efficacy, 
right? So I'm afraid, but I don't believe there's anything I can do in a dangerous situation is when that fear becomes paralyzing. If I start to have self-efficacy around personal safety, which is one of the things that we see that feminist self-defense training does, mm -hmm. is that the fear can sit alongside of that. But then the, and that's where we start to see that the fear no longer becomes paralyzing. The fear becomes a signal that a situation is dangerous. And the higher my self-efficacy and the more training I have around awareness, the more easily I can tell if a situation that I'm afraid of is actually a dangerous situation, or if it's something that I'm afraid of, but I can kind of take a step back and assess the situation, engage my level of threat in that situation. And that's one of the things that self-defense training will, will teach us to do. Mm -hmm. And Martha, do you, are, are you still heavily involved in, in the self? Because you went through a lot of different training courses over a long period of time. Are, do you, what's your relationship with those programs and, and, and courses now? Well, no, I don't teach self-defense at all. Um, and and I, as an academic, you know, I, it is an academic relationship mostly in the sense that, you know, I moved on and did other studies and, and did other work, but I've long been an advocate of um, self-defense training for women. And I, I'm convinced by all the scholarship that has accumulated over the past 30 years that it's extremely effective. So. Um, I'm an advocate, and that's part of what the blog does, is really try to get that scholarship out there to a wide audience, especially when there's still so, so much in the media that positions women's self-defense as some sort of naive, individualistic, and ultimately anti-feminist uh, strategy that really um, is, is a bad idea because it either doesn't work or it blames the victim mm -hmm. um, or it just takes away from trying to change the culture and convincing men to stop attacking women. So that, that constant um, discourse in the media is something that Jill and I created See Jane Fight Back as a blog to counter. But oh yeah, there's the blog. So sharing the screen yeah. of CJ and Fightback. So yeah, tell us a bit more yeah. about this. So so the blog is is that. So that's the way I'm most involved is really looking at um, what scholars and activists have, particularly feminist ones, have said about self-defense and really trying to bring the evidence-based scholarly mm -hmm. information out to a general public to counter some of the myths that continue to circulate in the media. Mm -hmm. So that's my big relationship with it now. And of course, Jill and I are in touch with a lot of self-defense instructors and other advocates. And we're on private Facebook groups with those folks. And mm -hmm. so we stay really involved, but um, I do not teach self-defense okay. at all. Okay. Jill, what, what's your relationship with it now? Your, your kind of living uh, practical relationship with it all? Yeah, I'm the so I'm not I'm not a primary instructor for the pre for prepare organization, but I teach with them and I bring them to my university. And so, um, uh, whenever I can, but certainly at least every other year, I offer a seminar on gender violence and women's resistance, which is open to anyone who wants to take it. It's open to uh, however people identify in terms of gender. It's not limited to women or women identified students. And we start out that class with a 16-hour um, full impact, full contact self-defense course. And um, I'm very fortunate I have some, I have an endowment that I can use to, to fund that course for students. So it's not limited to students' individual ability to pay. Um, and, and I deliberately put it at the start of the class in part because, you know, the literature that we read in that course is really on resistance to violence and successful resistance to violence, which as Martha said, is so at odds with their sort of cultural and oftentimes their individual experience mm -hmm. that I find that when I start bringing that information in, in the absence of self-defense training, I get a lot of yes, but. Well, yes, but that wouldn't work for me and I'm not an athlete and I'm not strong enough and I have this history and what if this and what if this and when and what if there's 30 men with machetes and mm -hmm. it sort of pulls for all of the kind of, as you said, the fear that we have around not just violence, but about completed violence. Mm. And so when I start out the course with that training and they have the, the sort of visceral corporeal experience of effective resistance against padded attackers, all of a sudden it changes their ability to interact with the data. And they can now start to think critically and analytically about the scholarship on resistance to violence. Um, so much of their exposure, even on you know, other feminist classes or gender studies classes where I talk about violence, there's a lot of information about how to prevent violence and how to avoid violence. Mm -hmm. 
And then we sort of jump to, but if violence is completed, here are the resources and here is the impact. And so some of the work that Martha and I have done sort of talks about that script. And one of the things that self-defense training does is it interrupts the script mm -hmm. that I can do all of these things to avoid. If violence is imminent or in progress, I have to wait till it's over. And then there's all of these things I can mm -hmm. do afterwards. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that this does is it lets them rewrite that cultural script that gives them options, right? So one option might be in the face of violence to capitulate, right? That this is a situation that I assess that, you know, not resisting is my best and safest option and self-defense training absolutely includes that as an option. Mm -hmm. But that's a very different choice, right? When I look at all of the options I have in front of me and I choose capitulation, I choose not to actively resist, then if I feel like there's nothing I can do, right? So same behavior, very different kinds of outcomes. And so they can start to look at the scholarship and look at the theory and look at the data because they now have an experience that as Martha has talked about in her book, really reorganizes gender at the level of the body. So they've gone you know, 18, 20 years with what feels to them like a very natural experience. And they find that 16 hours of, of self-defense training undoes that, which mm -hmm. is a sort of very strong statement that this is not a natural difference that we've experienced, but a cultural one that we've embodied. Okay, I mean, that I'm not, I, I, I'm not, I mean, I agree with, with both of you, uh, everything that you've said, and, and I agree with uh, the, the argument in, in Martha's book about, about unlearning certain aspects of femininity. But here's a question, I know this is, it's a kind of like a how long is a piece of string sort of a question, but in your experience, have you, and I'm not thinking necessarily of self-defense, but also self-defense and not just women, but also, also men or whoever, um, is there any risk of, uh, what are the risks of, of deluding yourself? What are the risks of, you know, because you, you, you see people with their black belts and, you know, men and women, and they're like, I'm this tough person and I'm, and, and that's a, a kind of definitely dangerous uh, outlook to have. And I know martial arts instructors who, who I don't think they could fight their way out of a paper bag and they teach self-defense courses. And I kind of think, what on earth are these people teaching? I mean, it, there must be some point at which you would say that's dangerous. And I'm not saying women don't fight back or women can't fight back. I'm saying there are some lessons and some teachers and some ways of teaching that possibly are negative or dangerous. How would you how would you respond to a question like that? Either either of you, both of you. Well, what the I never found a bunch of women in my study that that I came across who developed a false sense of security. I found um, an increased sense of confidence that they had options that they could engage if they were assaulted, and. Even then, there was still a realistic understanding of what your limits might be, and that if you didn't think you could take on these four people attacking you, and two of whom had weapons, uh, you you might make a choice to submit in that encounter. That doesn't mean you weren't defending yourself. So there was a broad and flexible understanding what self-defense was so that people didn't feel like um, they had to physically fight in every situation, even if it wouldn't have been safe for them to do so. So that was the general impression I got. I, I didn't myself talk to enough male martial artists or men who'd taken self-defense classes to know whether that was a gendered thing and whether men tended to be less humble about their abilities or not. So I don't know that in giving different talks around uh, over the years and meeting men who've done self-defense as teachers and as students, um, I found the same humility. I didn't tend to find people with a lot of false sense of security. Just most recently, I was at the College of Charleston and was talking to a, a man who runs his own dojo. And he was talking about how he, part of his, his self-defense is that he doesn't even go to places that he would consider to be dangerous. And he doesn't want to put himself in a situation where he would fight. He said, I don't, I don't go to bars and hang out at pool halls at two in the morning where there's a bunch of drunk, aggressive men. I don't want to be in a fight like that. And it isn't because he thinks he will or wouldn't win the fight. He just doesn't even want to be in that encounter. So that's the impression that I tend to have most of the time. So I'm not sure, you probably know more, Paul, about those kinds of people in, 
in the martial arts and could tell us. But. Well, I, <laughs> I think, um, you know, the, the false sense of security is one of the biggest arguments against self-defense training for women. And I was at a conference several years ago where um, a, 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 an abuse researcher said to me, you know, I want to be really clear with you. I don't believe this will work. I don't believe that women are capable of doing this, but we should not teach it to them just in case it will work. Because just in case it will work, we're then going to have these vigilante feminist Nazis roaming the country, you know, sort of look, looking to looking to wreak vengeance on male culture. And I thought, I took a moment and sort of savored that image and then suggested that, you know, perhaps that was an unlikely scenario. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting that people hold those ideas simultaneously. Women can't do it, but we can't teach them it just in case they will be not trust, you know, we can't trust them with violence and aggression the mm -hmm. same way we clearly can trust the, our, our, male, our male counterparts. But I do think that, you know, in the, in the courses that we've taught, when we teach, especially when we've taught mixed gender courses, one of the things that we find is that in the face of violence, most people are afraid. And Judith Howard, I think it was in a 1987 article, talked about how fear is a feminizing experience for both men and women. And, not, and that is not something, that is not an aspect of, fem, of femininity that anyone feels particularly good about, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that violence does, or the threat of violence, is that it can challenge aspects of masculinity. When we've taught the self-defense class for men, one of the things that happens is some men come in with lots of martial arts background, some men come in with nothing, but they all come in with the expectation that as men, they should be able to handle these situations. And one of the things that we find is that when we start to do some of the ground fighting where they're pinned for the first time and they do not know how to get out of it and all of the, either the training that they've had or the movies that they've watched, none of that is useful for them. Mm -hmm. Right. And actually what it does is, you know, in, in some sense, it's, it's harder to teach in those situations. You know, when you've got women coming in who may come in with the expectation that there's nothing they can do, they very quickly find out that there are men coming in or some men coming in with the expectation that they should be able to handle any situation just because finding themselves in a situation where they feel helpless, where they feel vulnerable, where they feel um, afraid is incredibly difficult to sort of work through or fight through in that moment. But what we find that it does is it builds an enormous amount of empathy. That this is, that the experience of violence is a human experience and not specifically a female experience, which might have been their expectation coming in. And so what we see is about sort of the, you know, the training and the experience to make good choices about violence. And I think especially for empowerment self-defense training and feminist self-defense training, a lot of those kind of gendered expectations or sort of puffing up and, you know, the performance of, you know, masculinity or aggression gets really put on the table in those classes in a way that in some other classes it might not. And there might be more of a risk in those situations. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I, I, I have a chihuahua, right? Um, <laughs> and he's really cool. Um, he's great. And, but I once uh, was ridiculed by a guy. I was walking the dog and this guy just really aggressively was said, actually said, aren't you ashamed to have a dog like that? And I obviously straight away I thought, this is just a challenge. That's all it is, right? And I said, no, he's a good dog. You know, I just played innocent. Anyway, the other day I was walking the dog and I saw this guy again. I was going to walk and then turn left. And he walked across left. And in my head, I was like, oh, but I was going to go left. And, I, and all my self-defense. And I was like, is this just situational wisdom? Mm -hmm. Or am I scared? And I didn't go left because I thought, I don't, I don't want to be anywhere near this man. And it's like, it was, it was, and afterwards I was like, am I scared? Was I, was I paralyzed with fear? Cause I, I knew what would happen or, or was that just wisdom? And it's, it is, it's really interesting that you kind of throw, it's just tiny little event like that. And, and all my masculinity is there going, you were scared of him. <laughs> it's really bizarre, isn't it? But anyway, I guess I should, I mean, in terms of your respective um, academic fields and your universities, I mean, how, what's the status that you find given to your, given to your work? I guess, Martha first, I mean, what, what's this, what, what, what was the response to your book? What's the, what, what's the status of it? And, and what kind of institutional or academic response have you had? Well, that's a great question because, uh, and it's part of why Jill and I bonded so much, I think, and have the blog and have continued to do other work. And the blog is almost therapy 
for us. Part of it, it's, you know, some of it is humorous and some of it is even when it's completely serious, it's a response to things we've heard people say or um, uh, people dismissing us. So for example, there's a blog post that is more, more on the humorous side that's based in my experience at a sociology conference a couple of years ago where I found myself like the old person there and I was at a session with mostly graduate students getting their PhDs and they were talking really negatively about their their own campus and a poster that was advertising women's self-defense training being offered on the campus, which of course Jill and I think, great, the campuses are finally doing what we've been saying for years they should do. And these, these graduate students, without even feeling they needed to provide an explanation, actually said, yeah, and they had a picture of Susan B. Anthony on the poster. Can you believe it? And I found myself there saying, and wait, wait, what, what's the problem with that? I don't understand. So there was a quotation by Susan B. Anthony on the poster that said something about how you can't rely on a man for protection. And this is a famous quote of hers. And they just, they started to sort of um, explain to me in a rather condescending way how I didn't understand that self-defense was victim blaming and that it wasn't feminist at all, and that women freeze when they are attacked. And they went through every single thing that we've heard over the years uh, mm -hmm. in, you know, in about 30 seconds. And so, um, you know, that this is sort of happens all the time, either amongst my own colleagues, um, I, Jill and I, I think we're texting each other when we were at our respective Title IX trainings at our universities that, that most professors have now had to go through in the United States anyway. And um, they presented such bogus information about how there wasn't anything women can do and you know anything about resistance and women's right to resist an attack was just mm -hmm. completely omit, omitted. And if you brought it up, you were corrected. And so, you know, it, it, it's not just the, that yes, it's a little bit of a bruise to our egos when we hear people right to our faces tell us how ridiculous our ideas are, and that they, you know, there's a side of me that wants to say, I wrote the book on that, yeah. or we, I, I'm a scholarly expert on that. Yeah. So I usually am polite and quiet, but you know, Jill and I will end up talking or texting or emailing, and we end up turning that into a blog post. So yeah. really, our blog is almost a chronicle of all the things that we are confronted with in our own work lives and and when we then that we come across on other blogs and in the media mm -hmm. that um where we feel like our work is never done because people are constantly um yeah. we, we in well-meaning ways dismissing the power and potential of resisting sexual assault I remember, I remember, I've just been one laughing in my head about the, it's not, it's very serious, but it is so beautiful the way that you write about it in, in, in the book. You, so you look at two different self-defense manuals, one from the 1980s and one from like the 1930s or something. And it's like in the 1980s, it's like women, if a man attacks you, you just got to kind of just, it'll get worse. It'll only be worse if you try to do anything about it. And then you flip back to the, to the 1930s one. If a man won't let go of your hand, and it's basically like, you kill him. And <laughs> crush him. <laughs> and you tear his arm off and you smash him on the head. And it was just like, and you're like, what's changed over the decades in the discourse? Yeah. And I was like, if a man won't let go of your hand, it's just amazing. Yeah, it's a, and I know you talked to Wendy Rouse, who looked at the um, women's martial arts training and the early 1900s, and the same yeah. thing. They they learned some really powerful techniques, and many of them were wearing you know long skirts and were yeah. very proper ladies in all these ways. And now you have these students, and 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 even the the young woman who was the trainer of my faculty group who came in from another university and trained us in uh, understanding sexual assault uh, as a problem on college campuses. And so she's extremely, you know, liberated in so many ways that we understand liberation today. And yet it was 
completely unheard of in her world to think about a, a woman ha having even the ability mm. um, or the right to resist mm. assault. And she even um, said, and we've probably heard this a million times, but she said it to that group that I should be able to walk across the campus naked and no one should touch me and no one should, and we should be teaching men not to attack us. And that's our goal. And I'm always like, can we do both? <laughs> we could teach men to be different and respect boundaries, but we also need to be realistic. Like realistically, there are a lot of things that would happen if you walked across campus naked. One, I think it's against the campus code and maybe the law. <laughs> so there'd be, you know, you could get arrested, but also it, you know, they're, they're just things that could happen because there are bad actors out there. So I think realistically, we want to talk about what women can do in the face of bad actors. And so it was just so interesting to me that um, the, the contemporary feminists are, um, I don't know, offended by those things that uh, mm. women 100 years ago were learning to do. Mm. And the, of course, contemporary feminists think of themselves as so much more progressive and liberated. But I sometimes wonder if we've taken a step backward, even, even with all the steps we've taken forward. Okay. Well, I, I think one of the things we've learned here is that we're old, right? That's, <laughs> wow, we're old. And our students remind us of that on a, on a daily basis. I think that, you know, with the, when the more I hear the stories and the more I hear the pushback, not just from individuals, but also from anti-violence groups, you know, rape, uh, rape crisis centers, domestic violence centers, right? is that it becomes very clear that the, the, the beef is not with self-defense, it's actually with shifting our understanding of gender. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, when we, ha we hear the victim blame thing a lot, that you are basically saying to women that this is what they should do, mm -hmm. which means this is what they should have done, and therefore they did not do it, and that is why they were assaulted. And every empowerment self-defense instructor that we have worked with, that we have talked with, makes it very clear that this is not about what you should do. This is about increasing the tools in your toolkit so that I have all of my choices in front of me and sort of to your chihuahua story point, right? So, I mean, should you be able to walk your chihuahua anywhere you want to? Absolutely. From a self-defense and awareness perspective, if this is someone who you know is interested in a fight, looking for a fight, do you walk your chihuahua into that fight? Probably not. Good self-defense would say, I'm gonna have some choices here about what I want to do and what's gonna keep me safe in the moment, right? And so I think that when we think about what self-defense training does is it really fundamentally challenges our beliefs about gender. And you know, I have lots of students in my classes who disclose a trauma history. And, and I have not had a student in that moment. And they, they walk in with an enormous amount of self-blame around their trauma. Um, they walk out of the class feeling, now I have options in the future that I did not have in the past. Mm -hmm. And we've done this class clinically with trauma groups. And, um, and there is no increase, in, you know, empirically, our data suggests there is no increase in self-blame. There's a decrease in self-blame. And so I think that the most, of the most of the pushback we get is from people who have not taken a class, who have not thought about taking a class, have not talked to people who've taken a class, but they're basing it on these sort of myths and cultural stereotypes about what it means to learn this. Mm -hmm. And how have, um, what have the responses to, to your, to your uh, work in this area been within, I guess, in around, around psychology or with your own, within your own university? What, what kind of responses have you had? You know, it's interesting. I'm very fortunate. I'm in a very small liberal arts school. Um, that has been structurally, from the administration point on down, incredibly supportive. I've taught the class not just for students. So since 1998, I've taught classes not just for students, but also for faculty and staff. I can't make them do all the reading. They're not as compliant as my students are. Um, but the university as a whole has been incredibly supportive of this work and incredibly supportive of having this program. Having said that, it is still not our primary Title IX program. It's still not our primary sort of work against sexual assault. And I think that, you know, programs like, you know, good self-defense training is not a three-hour workshop, right? It's not a quick film that I watch. And so there's, there's time and money and effort that gets invested in that. And so the university has been incredibly supportive of my interest in offering this to whoever will take it. Mm -hmm. As, having said that, you know, we still show lots of videos to our incoming first year students that sort of mm -hmm. talk to them about, you know, consent and other kinds of things, which are important, but don't, don't accomplish the same goals. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And um, I guess have you two got any um, big collaborations in the future, or do you, or do you, do you, are you planning to work independently and then maybe just come together occasionally, or have you got any combined projects? Jill, do you want we, to We always say? have projects. <laughs> yeah, there's about 20. But um, one of the things, or well, there's three main things I would say. One is we're trying to bring in guest bloggers. So, Paul, you're invited. Um, we really want more people to post to our blog than it has been just Jill and, Jill and I posting. And we, and we had a great guest blog post from Wendy Rouse, um, mm -hmm. and it got a lot of views. So that was called Fighting for the Vote. And that, of course, it's the 100 year anniversary of women's voting rights in the United States. So that was great to have uh, Wendy on there talking about it, but we really want more people doing that. So we're really trying to make our, make C. Jane fight back 2.0 oh, for okay. the next so little it's, bit. It's just cjanefightback.com. That's mm -hmm. yes. your blog. And, and in addition, um, I think we, we've been writing about uh, the ways in which uh, rape culture and various forms of sexual violence have moved online. And so we talk a lot about forms of self-defense in the digital realm. So that's something that we're writing on and, um, and even the importance of information privacy in relationship to sexual privacy in the digital age, because in the digital age, your sexual privacy and your information privacy are really converging. So if someone has to um, violate your information privacy and to violate your sexual privacy online. And so we really think that um, self-defense advocates and feminists who are concerned about uh, technology facilitated sexual assault can join forces with privacy advocates who are concerned and have historically been concerned with violations of information privacy. So that's another big thing that we've been writing. And then we also had a um, Mellon funded research project that really Jill got and brought me into where we have Jill's students permission to use these collages that they make in the course of their self-defense uh, course and their, their academic course on gender violence. Mm -hmm. And they do a before and after self-portrait and their self-portraits are amazing and they show this dramatic transformation that they go through when they've had that course. And there's something about the way that, that their artwork shows that transformation that's really different from just interviewing women and hearing them talk about it. Jill, you can say more, but that's another big collaboration we have. Yeah, it's really fascinating because when we ask people, you know, when, when, when the students are assigned the project, it is deliberately very open-ended and very unstructured, which they do not like. They say, tell me what paper to write and I'll write it. And I say, this is not a paper. Um, and I asked them to think about sort of a before and after or a before, during and after, but to think about sort of depicting that visually. And sometimes they come in with a theme. They might sort of think about, this is the way I see my body. And so they'll kind of look for images to tell that story. But oftentimes what they do is they just go and they find images that speak to them and they put them together. And so they realize what the transformation is after they've done the collage, not necessarily going into it having done that. And I think one of the things in this sort of speaks to sort of the the nonverbal ways that we kind of understand and experience this, right? That sometimes if, um, sometimes I'm sort of processing, the, processing this at a less cognitive level. And so I don't necessarily have the words to tell the story to talk about what it meant, but I can find other ways to kind of depict and understand what that transformation has been. And it's been very powerful. Okay. Uh, finally, I mean, there's, there's been a kind of elephant in, in my head at least. Um, I mean, we're, at, we're speaking to each other at a time when um, America, the United States, is 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 being consumed by racially uh, and anti-police, but racially organised um, violence um, and protests, and, and 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 you know the, the 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 racial dividing lines in the U.S. are are coming to the fore once again, and the whole world can see. I mean, are there differences? We've talked a lot about gender. But do we, are there any other demographic um, or, or socioeconomic or, or ethnic differences that you see in, in, the, in your experiences and the subjects and the conversations you've had and the research you've done around, around self-defense? 
Jill, you want to answer or should you first? So, you so this, is, this is actually our most recent blog post where we were, you know, wrestling with this issue. You know, I think one of the problems, and, and we've been doing it here, but it, it's very easy to fall into these sort of um, homogeneous categories. We talk about women as if women are a unified group and all women have the same experience and women relative to men who then also have the same experience, right? And we, and we all know that identity is far more complicated than that. And we also know that that violence is about intersectionality, right? It's not just about one particular aspect of identity, but about multiple aspects of identity. And that when we think about sort of structural access to power and structural access to privilege, that's not, you know, gender is not the only important category there. Um, and so I think that, you know, when we think about uh, when we think about women's safety in particular, that means very different things for very different women. And as the, you know, as some of our recent examples have been um, with uh, Amy Cooper, right, who is a woman in New York City, who we mentioned in our most recent blog post, who after being asked by a black man to put her dog on a leash in a part of the park where leashes are required, her response to this was to get on her cell phone and call the police and say that an African-American man was threatening her life. Right. Um, and so when we when we sort of look at those kinds of things, um, it's it's too simple to say I felt afraid and therefore anything I do in response to that fear is, is valid and justified. Right. I'll let Martha say more about that, too. Oh, yeah. Well, and it, and it was sort of a conversation, too, because we we know that um, self-defense has benefited a wide variety of women, even if their experience of violence in the past and the kinds of violence they fear going forward are influenced by their sexual identity, um, their race, their socioeconomic status, and so forth. And, and we know that the, the more dominant uh, identities and the more privileges a woman has the easier it's going to be for her to be understood if she used violence to defend herself, right? So of course, the, a larger woman, a, a black or brown woman, a lesbian woman was seen as even more abhorrent for her aggression historically by the legal system, for example. So there's, there's a long history of all women being uh, sort of punished and judged negatively for any aggression but there's certainly uh, an even harsher judgment on women who were not rich, white, straight, young, thin, pretty, et cetera. So there, there's that whole history that is really important to acknowledge. And then of course, women um, in the self-defense classes, they, they rehearse different scenarios depending on these different aspects of their identity, um, the types of violence they feared. And we know that um, black men in America have a terrible fear of violence because they're targeted um, by police and others for um, for being in, and are the objects of violence disproportionately. So there are, women aren't the only ones who fear violence and women fear it differently depending on their different identities and they get away with different types of things depending on all of those intersections of inequalities and privileges. One of the things we, Jill and I talked about that led to that blog post this week was just that, oh my gosh, you don't think that people think that women become like Amy Cooper if they take a self-defense class. That would be another reason people would be against training in self-defense. And so we really wanted to distinguish between becoming empowered and becoming like a racist asshole, because those are two totally different things, we think. And certainly empowerment-based self-defense training does not teach white women to go around calling the police on black men. And that it may not be able to combat someone who came into a self-defense class as racist, but it's certainly not the goal. And in fact, we hope that when women train in self-defense, they actually become more aware of the intersecting inequalities. And more able to judge reasonably what really is a threat and what isn't, what is a, an unreasonable fear versus um, a, a real uh, kind of gut feeling that something isn't right. And then of course, how to deescalate situations rather than escalate them. Mm -hmm. And one, one thing 
I would add to that is, you know, at, at the risk of oversimplifying and stating the obvious, right, violence is complicated and gender is complicated. But one of the things that we think self-defense training does is it sort of shakes up this idea of these discrete categories. And we see these, we see these ideas of discrete categories of people in bystander training, right? So bystander training says that you as the bystander should be able to intervene. And part of what that does is it positions people as being in these fixed categories, right? I am the victim. Martha is the bystander, you are the perpetrator. And so I as the victim can't act, but Martha as the bystander can act, and you as the perpetrator are sort of immune from violence in some particular ways. And I think one of the things that self-defense training reminds us is that if we all have a capacity for aggression, we can make choices about how to use that. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that women's perpetration is the same as men's perpetration or that well, white women's perpetration is the same as white men's perpetration, but it does remind us that these are not discrete categories. And so that I am not always in a victim category, I'm not always in a perpetrator category, that I can kind of move in between these kinds of things and that behavior and choices will be different by different people at different times. And I think that that understanding and that knowledge can help us sort of, when we, when we see a situation like this Amy Cooper situation is that we don't have to automatically go to who is the victim here, right? That, you know, victimization and perpetration happens in lots of different ways. Okay. And then I'm conscious of the time. I know that, that you're very busy and it's the start of your working week, but there's, I, I want to ask finally about the, the kind of media discourse about self-defense uh, uh, and gender um, in the US, because I, I did some research on uh, the British press a while ago and self-defense stories. And you could almost draw a line, you could draw a graph in which, like if say, if a white man um, is attacked in the street, but he's a martial artist, so he subdues, like it may say he's a jujitsu guy and he subdues the person. If that makes the newspapers, it's, that's just a fight. It's a fight, right? Someone attacks a white man, it's a fight. If a, a non-white man um, uh, with, a, with a foreign sounding name um, attacks someone, then that's always mentioned, name, ethnicity, blah, blah, blah. If, um, if, a, if a young white woman subdues an attacker, or a, a sexual or, 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 or a mugger or something like that. It's like a hero narrative. It's like a yay. It's a, it's, it's a, so, and it, it, there seems, it seems to be about the distribution of violence. And in the British press, violence is only ever good if, if, it's, if it's a female journalist writing about her self-defense course and going, wow, I really got into the violence of it. So you can almost draw some straight lines, like violence when it's men is bad, but the enjoyment of, only women are allowed to enjoy the, the revelation of violence. I mean, what's, what kind of structures do you intuit or do you feel or do you see in the media environment in, in uh, North America, in the US? I, I, think, I think we're starting to see a bit more of the hero narrative in some of the stories about women's successful use of violence to defend themselves. I think what we've seen much more of, you know, recent, in, in sort of recent years is the don't try this at home, right? So she'll tell a story, there's a good ending, but it's less a celebration of her use of effective self-defense and more of a she got lucky. Okay. You know, this is, you know, this is sort of an anomaly, right? This is, this, is, this is a great story, but this is not what most women can do, should do. It's not safe, right? Those kinds of things. I think that, um, I think that the narrative around whether the violence is sort of recognized or the, the, the appropriate use of violence is recognized or celebrated is very much about all of the kinds of pieces that Martha talked about. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and we're seeing this now, right? We're seeing lots of narratives about, um, you know, brutality by white police officers being reified as reasonable because they are perpetrating against black men who are there then framing in these very negative and stereotypical kinds of ways. Yeah, and we do have this sort of media celebration like you you found, Paul, where, you know, if it's a, a, a helpless seeming little girl or a helpless seeming grandma and they defended themselves, and, and even if they did so incredibly brutally, yeah. um, the, there's a sort of media celebration around that. That becomes a meme. That's something that's celebrated even by some of the feminist bloggers who actually talk negatively against self-defense. So there is this sort of, as, as long as it seems transgressive and upsetting of the, the stereotypes, then we can celebrate it. But if it seems to fall into any of the existing stereotypes, like uh, a man 
um, who had to defend himself against another man, or if, what if he had to defend himself against a woman, then all of a sudden it's like, ooh, that's sketchy, or maybe he got into it, or that's, that's an expression of his hegemonic masculinity. We should criticize it. And I hope we get to a point in our society where we're willing to celebrate or validate anyway, uh, someone's defending themselves when they needed to, regardless of their class or race or gender, and regardless of the class, race, gender, and so forth of the perpetrator. So to me, it should ultimately be about perpetrating um, as bad and defending yourself legitimately as legitimate. So it, it does seem like the media sensationalizes those stories where um, it's, it's obviously, it seems safe to do so. And then they don't know what to do with a situation where um, men are the victims, for example. And there's a terrible story of the um, rapist in England who went to prison. I think it, he was already convicted, um, where the, the most number of rape victims in England's history, as I recall reading in The Guardian, right? And, the, and his victims were all men. He found them outside of bars and drugged them and raped them. And it was horrible. And I couldn't believe that there wasn't more of an outcry around that. And I couldn't help but think it was because it didn't fit the stereotype that the victims were not women. Um, and so, so I, I think we see that in general. That, it, almost, um, it almost confirms the other stereotype about the predatory homosexual. Uh, that, that, is the, that is the object of homophobic phobia. I mean, so yeah. yeah. Um, we've we've talked for a long time. Uh, I could talk all day. Uh, it would be great if we could, but um, uh, I think that we should we should we should close it there. That was really really interesting, and I thank you so much for um, taking the time to talk to me at the start of your of your week. Um, it was really great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks.